Welcome to Radical Responsibility, the podcast dedicated to ridding the world of blame and shame, where we explore the issues you care about from a unique perspective. 100% ownership for each and every circumstance we face in life, day in and day out. Hello, this is Fleet Mall, and you are listening to the Radical Responsibility podcast. And we're here today with Eric Ukelevich. Uh, how you doing, Eric? Good this morning. Thanks. How are you, Fleet? I'm great. Great. I'm really excited to be doing the first podcast recording for the new Radical Responsibility podcast. We're not sure whether this will air as episode one or episode two uh, or three, but uh, it is the first one we're recording, and I'm excited to be doing that and exciting to be doing it with you. Good. I'm glad you're get your, uh, launching off the podcast. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to just uh, give our listeners a, a little information about you and uh, and then a little further disclosure I'll mention in a moment. So Eric Ukelevich is a photographer and videographer and recently began another pass as a marketer and organizer in the world of personal evolution. He's been stewarding a powerfully bonded men's group for over four years and is a member of the Mankind Project, an international men's organization. All his work these last few years, both artistic and otherwise, has been around helping to find what is authentic and true about someone and celebrating and beautifying it. So that sounds like a wonderful mission in life. And just for sake of full disclosure, Eric and I are working uh, very closely together on um, uh, getting the radical responsibility message out to the world, including... uh, uh, my new Radical Responsibility book that's going to be released uh, May 14th and uh, and various online courses and offering we're doing. So Eric and I work closely together on that. However, um, uh, I'm really excited about doing this um, podcast with you uh, because you have a very extensive background yourself in uh, personal evolution work and in creative work and being an entrepreneur. So uh, I'm really excited to explore this today. And uh, as you know, Eric, uh, the theme of this is radical responsibility. And what we mean by that is uh, voluntarily embracing 100% responsibility or ownership for each and every circumstance we face in life, day in and day out, which includes those in which we can see we maybe had some role to play, but also those that maybe just seem like they fell out of the sky and landed on our head. But nonetheless, we're going to embrace ownership for these circumstances, not as any form of self-blame. It is absolutely not self-blame, but rather just because it's the only place we have any real power, real self-agency, focusing on what can I do? What's the most creative way I can respond to this particular circumstance I'm dealing with, whether it's an internal circumstance within myself, physically, psychologically, spiritually, or an external circumstance in the world around me. And so... Uh, that's the basic idea. And to the extent that we do see we had any role in, in creating or inviting or manifesting a particular circumstance, seeing that is not for the purpose of self-blame, but just for the purpose of learning. Because if we see that a particular way we approach something didn't work out so well, we can try a different approach in the future. So that's the basic idea with you're very familiar with. But I'd like to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, your background in this work in particular. So we met through a training called The Event, which is where at least some of the distinctions in my radical responsibility model arose from the event, which I'm very grateful for. And I'm still very involved in leading the event, as are you. And uh, you've also done a uh, you've been through my radical responsibility courses and so forth online. And you also recently did a uh uh, a Tony Robbins event, the Unleash the Power Within, and you've been involved, uh, as I mentioned in your bio, in the Mankind Project for quite a while. So this is a lot of personal evolution work, and I'm curious about what you see as a through line for you in terms of that kind of work and your own path through this uh, through this work. Well, for me, a lot of it has to do with um, a love of learning and seeing positive results after after doing each one of those things you know after doing the event i learned uh, a lot about how i showed up and how i could show up and things that are getting in the way so in a way it's um you know 
it's all it's all self learning. It's all like, oh, uh, this is this is possible. I'm possible of this. I can show up this way. Uh, I can serve this way. And um, you know, each time I I do or participate or learn, and it doesn't have to be you know formal structured practice or stru- formal structured events. I learn I learn about myself and I show up uh, in the world a way that feels better to me and feels better to my friends and family and those that I serve and you know I, I can see it in people and I can see it in in myself um, you know on the baseline I'm just a happier human being and uh, you know there's there's part of me that's like I show up to these things and I don't really know I don't really know why just feels like the right thing to do and after i'm finished it's like yeah that was the right thing to do it doesn't have to have a specific purpose you know it's just it yeah, feels like the right thing to do you know well, let's get let's get down and dirty here how bad was it before you began this work um i, I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek but but you know sure. to the extent that you're willing to go there we could go there and 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 you know how bad was it and then what what were some of the core distinctions that really began to shift something for you and and why how did that why did that work uh how bad was it i was hmm. well in a way you know, with a lot of this work you don't know what you don't know and the things that have been revealed to me is how kind of scared and um small i showed up um in the world and mostly in my head in the world which is how it all works um but i was you know generally going through motions you know looking back at it now i would say i was not really happy uh, I wouldn't say unhappy. I wouldn't say miserable. But in, in comparison to how I feel going through life now, um, you know, uh, in comparison, yes, I, I was unhappy and and unfulfilled, and um, and doing all this work, it, you know, uh, happier, more fulfilled human being is the short version of it. Mm-hmm. And the event was the first training you did, right? Yes, that was the first and, first training. And, and so what would you say was the the core distinction you got in that training that began to shift things for you? Or the core insight or the core insight from that first event was um actually how much power I had and not just just physically but in a I don't know as a, as a human um yeah, I think about that one a lot because it was the first big shift and it was for me uh very physical and very embodied and I think that was the first time I felt that physical and that embodied um ever you know ever in my life like by the after my first you know we call it the the demand after my first real big piece of work my body was electric I couldn't sit down for 30 minutes, you know, in a way of, uh, you know, adrenaline and release and, you know, all of this, um, you know, uh, trauma feels like a harsh word, but I guess everything is, you know, trauma releasing from my body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, it was uh, partially a a huge weight and partially, yeah. I don't know electrifying. It's the only way I could I can really phrase it because I mm-hmm. I really could not sit down for thirty minutes. I had to pace. I had to move. Yeah. So in reflecting on my question, how bad it was before you you had mentioned kind of that you you recognize now in retrospect that you were operating from a lot of fear and kind of uh, feeling small and being small in a sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in the event, it sounds like what you're saying is you you connected with your personal power. Uh, either for the first time or in a, an entirely new way uh, and in a very embodied way that you actually experienced in the body very powerfully. Yes. <laughs> well said. Yeah. yeah. That's great. That's great. So uh, when was the last, how old are you, Eric? I am 38. 
38. So I just want to give people a sense of where you are in your life cycle. Mm -hmm. So uh, when was the last time you uh, punched the clock, had a nine to five job where you were working for somebody else? Uh, never, uh, potentially, a s well, that's not true. Uh, my very first job was in, was in fast food, you know, when I was mm -hmm. in high school, uh, I think I worked a summer as a, as a temp, probably either a summer between college years. And that was, yeah, that was the last time. Yeah. So since then you've been an entrepreneur and you're a creative person, so, uh, you've been doing uh, photography and videography has been one of your main uh, um, creative endeavors and sources of livelihood. Have you had other uh, uh, personal businesses or livelihood uh, adventures outside uh, of the photography and videography? Outside of that field? Not really. It was all in that in that creative work. It was all related to uh, either either my creativity my photography or somebody else's uh mm -hmm. i would often work with other photographers mm -hmm. uh, either on their shoots or afterwards and to um you know organizing their their digital workflow um because i am inclined that way i am good mm -hmm. with computers and i think logically and i'm pretty organized so all that mm -hmm. stuff works out well for me yeah so you know you graduated college when you were probably around 22 i assume and so you had a couple of summer jobs where you were working for someone that like many, many of us got our start in a fast food summer job somewhere. Um, and uh, really since then, you've been on your own and been responsible for uh, getting your own gigs and uh, and developing your own clients. And whether, you know, it was projects you were doing directly or whether you were uh, assisting with someone else. But anyway, you had to land all these gigs and, and you've had to manage yourself and your business financially and uh, be on your own in that way uh, with no no uh, guaranteed steady paycheck or benefits or anything like that for a long time. So uh, let's see, you take uh, 22 from 38, that's about 16 years. So how has that been? Uh, how's that been? It's been, you know, it feels like feast or famine a lot of time, I think, mm -hmm. as it does a non entrepreneur. Uh, it feels like I've had good years, I've had less good years, and uh, overall, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, definitely feels like that this stress of entrepreneurship, you know, often making just enough to get by or just a little less to get by, and then some years, you know, more than I need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's there's times of fear, obviously. Most definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know... Uh, any entrepreneur or anyone living in an entrepreneurial way is, uh, if they're honest, they're, they're dealing with fear all the time. But fear can be very, fear is intelligent. And uh, um, it's just a question of how we work with fear, right? And uh, uh, fearlessness is not the absence of fear. Fearlessness is our capacity to be with fear in a creative way. And it can really drive a lot of our creativity and so forth. So, um so, uh, I, you know, a radical responsibility is a philosophy and approach that will uh, support anyone in optimizing their life, whether they take an entrepreneurial path or they're, uh, they're working for someone else in a small business or they're working in the big corporate setting or they're a professional or, uh, you know, a teacher or a counselor or a craftsperson, whatever they're doing. And uh, it's a, just for sake of full disclosure, I have a little bit of bias towards uh, the entrepreneurial life. And, uh, and, uh, so, um, just because I think it's exciting and it, it marries very well with, uh, the idea of radical responsibility because we are really taking ownership. But even if we're working for someone else, we're in a corporation, even we're working for the government, what have you, uh, still, uh, you know, we're really, I, what I coach, I do a lot of coaching with people, both in the direct business setting and, and somewhat in the personal setting. And I really encourage everyone, even if they're working in a large corporation or working for the government, to think of themselves as an entrepreneur. They are a business into themselves, and they are offering their services, their time, and their talent, and they're getting compensated for that. And rather than just thinking of ourselves as sort of, uh, you know, a dependent employee of a particular company or entity, to, to really have that sense of entrepreneurship that we are 
in a business exchange with that organization. And it's got, it needs to be a win-win. And at any point that it's not, we need to own that and make the changes necessary. So uh, at any rate, it's exciting to talk to uh, someone who, uh, like yourself, who, you know, with no guarantees ever since college, you just jumped in there and you've been doing it and uh, living with that fear and anxiety around financial security for quite a while. And, and uh, hopefully now on a track to, uh, to really taking uh, that whole game to the next level for yourself. That is the plan for the future. A lot of changes in the last year and mm -hmm. a lot of uh, optimism looking forward. Mm -hmm. So I know that you um, work a lot on your personal disciplines and uh, uh, your personal habits, the positive habits that, that set us up for success, right? Uh, and uh, why don't you talk a little bit about those? I know you've You've worked with some of even Pagan's ideas. Um, um, I know you you picked up some things from the Tony Robbins training. I know you worked with uh, what's the gentleman that does the uh, immersing immersing yourself in frigid water and doing breathing techniques? Uh, he's from Sweden. Wim Hof. Yeah, is, Wim Hof. Is he from Sweden? Uh, he is. Oh, I feel like I should know. Uh, his camp is currently in Poland. Um, uh, Wim Hof. Yeah. I, I had the impression he was Scandinavian uh, from one of the countries there. But at any rate, yeah. so why don't, you, why don't you talk a little bit about some of those uh, disciplines and how you work with your morning period and just, you know, work with setting yourself up for success, uh, you know, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and so forth. Sure. Um, I feel like it's uh, constantly evolving and constantly changing. Um, but at the moment, uh, when everything gets done, uh, my, my personal morning starts with, um, uh, a priming exercise, you know, Tony Robbins priming exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel that's a good way to kind of start with, uh, gratitude and a feeling of, um, accomplishment. Mm -hmm. uh, Could you describe that a little more specifically for our listeners? Sure. Um, uh, it starts with, uh, some quick breathing breathing mm -hmm. exercises, uh, mm -hmm. partially to get, uh, I think to wake you up and to feel embodied, mm -hmm. uh, I think I'll wake you up and, um, and it goes into uh, a gratitude practice. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, then it goes into a practice around kind of healing yourself, uh, spiritually, emotionally, um, you know, feeling healed, uh, in whatever practice, religious way you'd like, mm -hmm. you know, just as a healing energy and then taking that energy and healing those around you and everyone around you, you can take it as far as you'd like. Mm -hmm. And then from that place, um, from that, you know, place of being healed and powerful and awake and embodied, um, picturing three goals that you want to accomplish, you know, in the distant future you know, anywhere from weeks to months to a few short years. And in a way of being in a place of accomplishing those goals. So not, I want to do this thing. You know, I want to put out this book. It's, I've put out this book. I and putting so. yourself in a place of having already done it. Right. Yeah. Creating that vision. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's great because uh, many uh, different areas of psychology have uh, recognized how Sometimes we're called teleologic beings. In other words, we step into that which we can envision. So if you want change in your life, you first have to be able to envision it as a concrete reality. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a, a, a note of uh, caution here, you mentioned the breathing exercises, and I actually uh, use a lot myself, a lot of breathing exercises. I encourage people because it's really the quickest access to self-regulation. Uh, we can downregulate ourselves when we're getting too upregulated, too emotionally activated, or too physiologically activated, uh, and we can upregulate ourselves when when we need to sort of wake up and get our energy moving. So there are lots of wonderful techniques. However, uh, I would encourage our listeners, if they're interested in that, to always explore those with good teachers and good coaches, and make sure that they're uh, doing that in alignment with uh, their medical providers and. Uh, and so forth, so that you always approach it in a in a reasonable way and take good care of yourself. So I just wanted to mention that. But I would encourage our readers uh, to to explore those kind of things because it's a very simple way to 
to begin to regulate ourselves and take ownership for our own physiological and emotional state. Most definitely. And it feels like everything comes back to breathing in some ways. Mm -hmm. You know, meditation, you know, the anchor of that is breathing. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we can always just stop and, and just take a breath, right? And and I don't you don't I don't think you need a doctor's advice to do that one, right? It's very simple. Just stop and take a breath. In fact, I have a little thing on my uh wristwatch now that reminds me to do that and uh it actually does this little vibration thing and it takes me through a minute of kind of uh, uh conscious breathing and uh quite a few times a day, so it's a nice little tool. <laughs> Selfishly, mm-hmm. it's it's nice to know that someone with decades of meditation practice uh, still could use reminders from time to time. Oh yeah, need all the help I can get. So uh, so let, let's continue with your morning then. What else? So you, you do these priming exercises, the series of the breath work and the gratitude work, and then kind of envisioning the future you want to step into as if it's already happened to set yourself up for that. And uh, then what's next? Uh, then I. Um... A short exercise routine where I do, um, I think New York Times and someone else has published like a seven and a half minute uh, high intensity workout, you know, mm-hmm. 30 second uh, activities, 10 second break, you know, over and yeah, over again. There's but a no. number of those supposedly uh, advertised as scientifically determined to, uh, I think the plank pose is one of them. And yep. yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Punches, plank pose, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and there's a number. From... There's a number of good apps that have that seven minute workout on it. Yeah, yeah, I use one of those. I use one of those, and then f- after that one, uh, short break, I'll do um, interval jump rope training. So, mm. this... uh, two, you know, two minutes loose, thirty seconds high intensity. Two minutes, you know, comfortable pace, thirty second high intensity. Um, it's the same idea, but uh, you know, to get my heart rate going. Um, and to get my cardio up because I feel like I've never had a good sense or, or a good um, length, you know, where I can be at optimal heart rate and not want to pass out and die. Mm-hmm. So I always try to keep that up as much as I can because that, for me, drops off very quickly. Well, that's great, and I'm envious because uh, I was at a I, – I think it was a hotel gym just, I don't know, in the last month anyway somewhere. And uh, – um, you know, doing various exercises with the machines and so forth. And then I noticed there was a jump rope hanging on the wall, right? So I grabbed it and tried to do some, I almost killed myself. <laughs> I almost I tripped up myself and stumbled and then, then tried to decapitate myself with the rope. And I, I, I would have needed a lot of practice to get back into that. I've had two knee replacements, so I don't know if that's in my future, but maybe we'll see. Maybe with comfortable shoes. Yeah. Maybe with comfortable shoes. Yeah, I first got into to jump roping because I've been training, you know, often on Muay Thai for about 10 years. And it's the beginning of every workout. It's five minutes of jump rope with a, with a, uh, a thick Thai style jump rope. So it's heavy. It's, almost, it's like pipe. Uh-huh. Uh, not quite pipe, but it's, uh, you know, kind of flexible plumbing pipe uh-huh. uh, as a jump rope instead of the speed ropes. I uh, see. So that was, mm-hmm. that was my reintroduction uh, other than childhood to jump roping. I see. Well, I was about to say jump roping is, you know, because the sexy thing about jump roping for me, I think, is it is associated with boxing and all the great boxing movies. You see them, you know, Rocky using a jump rope and so forth. So um, so that's a very cool thing about jump roping. Uh, I do remember it back to school. It seemed like it was more the the, the girls did it at school. and the, uh, But I guess the guys did it too. And But you'd jump in and out. They Two people would have the rope going and people would jump in and out and so forth. But that's a long time ago. Most of my current associations are with boxing movies, and so that makes jump roping, jump roping very cool, even though I'm not so sure I, boxing is really cool if I think about it. But anyway, I would like to think it's cool if I wasn't actually sitting there watching the mayhem. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's a, it, it looks like mayhem from the outside, and it's a lot of, you know, science and a lot of finesse mm-hmm. on the inside. Well, Muay Thai in particular, and Muay Thai does include boxing, both boxing and kicking. So uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that? When they, I have a very close friend who's actually my, my financial advisor uh, who just got his black belt in Muay Thai recently. So he's really into it. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience with Muay Thai, when you got started and how that's, you know, what that's done for you? Sure. Uh, I got into... Uh, let's see. I did Taekwondo as a kid. Uh, I think it was, you know, the Karate Kid part one, 
uh, that got me interested in martial arts. Mm -hmm. And then I'm pretty sure I asked my parents. And shortly after that, they enrolled me. So I did Taekwondo, you know, from when I was 7 to 11, got my black belt at 11 years old. Uh, you know, at a strip wow, mall. That's pretty Taekwondo cool. Taekwondo school. Um, mm -hmm. Master was very old school, uh, probably a little bit too old school. If anyone got out of line, we got hit with a PVC pipe. Ooh. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's not allowed anymore. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. I think that would be cause for a lawsuit pretty quickly these days. Yes, I would say so. Uh, <laughs> luckily, I was a pretty good listener, so I never got whacked with a pipe, um, aka medicine. Um, but after that, I did uh, uh, kickboxing for a little while uh, at, a, at a fitness gym. They had a class and then took only oh, about 10 or so years off of martial arts. And then after grad school, I saw a commercial uh, for a, a Muay Thai gym in my town. And it was one of those I, I've been interested in, you know, martial arts and martial arts films. And, um, you know, Muay Thai was for me, always a beautiful looking, brutal sport that there's no way I could ever do. Um, and then I saw the commercial. I was like, well, I can't do that. I guess I have to go try and do that. You know, it's, uh, it's almost like a Tony Robbins saying, it's like, if you can't, you must mm -hmm. is one of his so it kind of felt like that. It's like, yeah, I could never do that. And then within, within a month I was hooked. Uh, yeah, within a month, I started taking itself, uh, taking myself and the practice very seriously. Um, I was, uh, by all standards, overweight uh, and out of shape when I signed up. And within nine months, I lost almost 30 pounds. I was showing up at the gym two, three times a week for, I think, classes back then were almost two hours. And uh, in the meantime, running in between classes. So I watched, you know, a physical, emotional transformation in about a year. Mm -hmm. you know, it was another way. I was like, oh, you know, it was almost like my first event. It's like, mm -hmm. ah, I have, I have power. I have, mm -hmm. you know, the capacity to change. I have, um, I'm not who I thought I was, you know, in the best way, you know. And I thought I was always going to be, you know, kind of overweight and kind of slow and, you know. Mm -hmm. in, a, in the loose term, never a badass and all of that. And after, you know, after a year of Muay Thai, it's not like I walked around feeling like a badass, but I definitely felt stronger, more confident. And, uh, you know, in a way that I never had before. Yeah, that's fabulous. Cause you, you actually really shifted your self concept pretty dramatically. Yes. Again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> again. yeah. again. Yeah. That's it. That's very cool. Absolutely. Yeah. I know my, uh, Again, my financial advisor, uh, Mike Brady, who's going to be a guest on this podcast, uh, very interesting entrepreneurial gentleman. And he is, you know, he was into the physical stuff uh, when I, uh, he was at one point vice president or and maybe then president with a, uh, a wealth management firm that was a client of mine. And that's where we got to know each other over quite a few years. And, and there was a period I remember when he was into doing marathons and triathlons and got up at four in the morning to go work out and did all that. And for a number of years, super shape. And then he let go of it for quite a while. Long time, I think. I don't know how long. But but then a couple of years ago, got back into Muay Thai. And he is a lean, mean fighting machine today. I'll tell you, he's something else. I think he puts in like three hours a day. And uh, so, and it uh, he really talks about how it has transformed his life. Yeah, it's it's addicting. I haven't been back to the gym in a couple of months. And I'm definitely, I'm definitely missing it. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, in a way it's, um, you know, on a, on a daily basis now, it's like, it's something I'm scared of and I show up to anyway, mm -hmm. you know, especially not doing it as often as I used to. Um, you know, now every time I go back, I feel like I'm, I'm paying, I'm playing catch up and, uh, you know, it's like, well, I survived another class. I grew a bit. I showed up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's mm -hmm. the next time. Yeah, great. Well, that's all we that's really all we need to do in life is show up. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, well, let's explore the dark side of that a little bit. I'm saying that a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, um, you know, in, in Muay Thai, you get hit, right? Um, uh, you, yes. You get kicked, then you get hit. You usually wear a head protection, right, in the gym? Some, uh, not always. Depends. depends. It, 
it depends. And my gym is, um, I'll give it a little plug, uh, North Jersey Muay Thai mm-hmm. in Lodi, New Jersey, is um, very old school in the best way. Mm-hmm. You know, they have, um, it's not about aggression at all, mm-hmm. uh, even though it is, it can be a very brutal sport. Um, the training is very little about, especially in the classes, unless you're on the fight team, there's there's contact for sure and you feel it for sure um but it's not about aggression at all it's like the people that come with with aggressive intent get weeded out pretty quickly and they usually don't come back you know it feels like a a family Mm -hmm. you know it's like do you want to hit your brother you know and i'm sure some ways you do want to hit your brother but not not in this case you know it's like everyone yeah it feels like it feels like a family like people show up four or five times a week Mm -hmm. uh you know, to kick and punch each other, you know, on the surface, but you know, it's a beautiful, well, it's well, a beautiful dance. Well, that's a great segue right there because what I wanted to explore was associating this with for all our cult followers of Bike Club out there. So, big thing about Bike Club and where it initiated was, you know, just getting hit. That something about being willing to get hit and then getting into that, you know, there was, you know, that. Bike Club can be looked at as a pretty dark movie and a real reflection of the despair of modernity, even a modern version of Death of a Salesman in a certain way of just, you know, young men and middle-aged men finding themselves in a state of complete meaninglessness and then having to go down into basements and beat on each other to find a sense of being alive in their life, right? So in many ways, it was about that and exploring that, that darkness in our culture. But there was something enlivening for them, clearly, about getting hit and hitting. So uh, do you have any associations with that for for yourself? I'm sure you know the movie. Yeah, I do. I do. And, you know, for me, it's about you know, stepping into stepping into fear because I hate getting hit. You know, mm-hmm. anyone anyone has sparred with me. You know, I'm not the toughest guy in the room by by any means. Um you know, and like we said, it's about it's about showing up. It's about doing something that, for me, is uncomfortable uh, and, in a way, strengthening. You know, it's a it's a way that taking on something that is uncomfortable and hard, showing up and getting better for it, you know, and doing it as consistently as possible. You know, in, in some way, it's it's conscious suffering. You know, it's fun. It's good exercise. You know, physically exhausting and enlivening um and also challenging myself in a way that i you know i don't ever get challenged you know i don't i've never been uh in a fight in my life you know not a real one you know, it's not it's not not who i was and not my not my way and it's uh it's a way that i get to put myself in that discomfort you know in a way of feeling you know, in some, in some ways threatened, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in a way that's uncomfortable, mm-hmm. uh, always safe, but in a way that's, yeah, someone's actually trying to punch me or kick me in the head. That is happening. Mm-hmm. What am I going to do about it? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very interesting. You know, uh, just a, a little disclosure with, with myself, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've never been, uh, uh, inclined towards uh, physical combat, I've done some pretty crazy things in my life and definitely stepped into the fray. Uh, I won't go into detail until I check on a statute of limitations. But <laughs> it's Most of it's like 40 years ago or uh, so. I'm probably okay. <laughs> but, um, uh, but you know, I've never actually really been inclined to get in there and, you know, fist fight. It's not, not a natural inclination. And, and my, my own spiritual path is primarily grounded in the Buddhist tradition where non-aggression and gentleness are very important. But at the same time, my particular lineage has a lot to do with the idea of warriorship. Um, you know, not necessarily physical combat, but warriorship in terms of bravery and courage and, and you know, being willing to live with vulnerability and your heart open. But still, there's some sense of being able to show up. And so I, I am curious about, you know, maybe even at this latter point in my life to maybe explore something like that. There was It was funny, what during my prison years, which I'll reference here, but not go into, and that will be covered in... Uh, another of my podcasts, but uh, I had a series of recurring dreams for a long time. And I think I had them for a while post-prison of where I was into boxing and they didn't have boxing at the prison I was in, which is, you know, what's strange about it, but I was into boxing and I was actually getting pretty good at it and had overcome my fear of, of uh, combat. And uh, 
And I had these dreams for quite a long time. So I'm not sure what that's all about. But I remember in the dreams, it felt good to be able to step in there and uh, and hold my own, you know. And um, yeah, so I think it probably is uh, mostly about, uh, it's probably about uh, challenging ourselves around fear. And so the, you know, what fear tends to really reduce our lives, right, with all the different experiences we have from childhood going forward, we just start shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And, and in many case, many of us live much smaller lives than we need to because we're trying to avoid various things that we learn to be afraid of, right? So expanding our world again by stepping into fear. And then uh, there's also probably something very enlivening, right, about that physical uh, contact and, and being in that place of fear and the contact. There's something probably very enlivening and energizing about that, I would imagine. Definitely. Uh, energizing and embodied, mm -hmm. you know, it's that for me, I live uh, too much of my life in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't really do that while doing Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, yeah, it's if a, you're in your head, forced you're, you're, body practice. <laughs> yeah, if you're in your head, you're li li likely to get sucker punched, right? Exactly. Yeah. So um, why don't we shift a little bit here? Um, you're a dad. Um, you have a daughter, uh, Ada, she, what, eight or nine, something like that. She is six. Six. Uh, oh, younger than I thought. Seven. Yeah. She'll be seven actually in about three weeks. In three weeks. She's probably excited about that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, why don't you talk a little bit about your role as a dad and showing up as a dad and, uh, kind of how that ties into your path of personal evolution and this, you know, these ideas around personal responsibility and ownership and, and so forth. Sure. Um, hmm. well, it feels like the, the logical place to start was uh, a few years ago when, um, when I got divorced, I had to make a pretty big uh, decision around time with my daughter. Uh, and one of my biggest fears around that you know, it was one of the things that went through my head. The thought was, I don't want to be a weekend dad. I don't want to be a weekend dad. And I assumed that that was the case because that's what I knew. That's what I had seen um, with other working parents, you know, especially fathers. Um, and what's funny and feels a little obvious, one of the, one of the men in my men's group um, said, okay, then don't. Choose something else. And honestly, it never occurred to me, um, you know, to choose to choose something else. And, um, you know, we were going through mediation and making these decisions at that time. And, you know, I was like, oh, I can choose something else. Okay. I choose, I choose half time. I want, I want a half time. Um, and that for me has been the anchor to the last few years of my life. Um, I get, a week at a time with my daughter and I wouldn't trade that for the world. Um, and from there, all of their decisions are made, you know, it's like, okay, I get her from Sunday to Sunday, you know, with some flexibility depending on, you know, schedule and vacations and what's happening. But I get her, I get her for a week. Um, you know, I take her to school. I pick her up from school and I am full-time dad for a week. Uh, and I got all the all the benefits of that, and I get all the stresses from that. Um, and I wouldn't I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I would, uh, you know, I would take definitely more and more time. Um, then, uh, yeah, and I've I've become a better human being for it. Uh, better, better father, better person, better friend. Because uh, I've made that I've made that choice, and I make that choice kind of over and over again with jobs I take, jobs I don't take, um, ways I work, you know, even decisions I make every morning. It's like, okay, um, do I do I want to, you know, do the things I need to do right now, or do I do what Ada needs right now? And it's, you know, how you know how do I want to parent? is is a lot of my motivation around the personal growth work the personal evolution work you know, how do i want to show up for her you know she's my she's my anchor you know it's uh 
Yeah. Yeah. She's your anchor in sense of, um, well, I would assume it sounds like a real motivation, a real motivation to continue your work because that's directly related to how you're going to show up with her, for her, and what you're going to model for her. And as well as just being an anchor in the sense of keeping you grounded, you, you've got to be there. Yes. Yeah. That's great. I have to do this consistently. I have to show up. Well, have yeah. to. We're going to go, uh, you know, proper. Uh, I choose to over and over again. Mm-hmm. I choose to show up. I choose to do it this way. Well, it's incredibly admirable, and it may seem just logical and natural, but, you know, unfortunately, there are so many uh, parents that are are not making that particular choice. And uh, in some cases, out of uh, uh, maybe a, a lack of motivation for one reason or another, or just because they don't know that they can make that choice, or because of, you know, the stresses and challenges of their life and their economic situation and all kinds of factors may be putting them in a very difficult position where it would be incredibly heroic for them to make that choice. But nonetheless, even though, you know, we recognize them from the perspective of radical responsibility, anyone that w- that's in a struggling situation in their life, we know there's all kinds of causes and conditions. So it's not about blaming them for the circumstances they find themselves in. But at some point, the only way that's going to shift is for uh, any one of us to start taking ownership for the choices we make. And uh, uh, so, you know, you're really modeling making some really important choices here that are uh, incredibly impactful for your daughter. And I I really think for the future of humanity, I mean, you you could make some pretty strong arguments that the the current state of our our culture and society and, and where it can be in the future uh, has a lot to do with our commitment or lack of commitment to parenting and quality parenting. So, Thank you. Uh, so it, it's it's really uh, it's really inspiring that that you made those choices and you've been able to really organize your life professionally and as an entrepreneur and as a, a creative person and a business person to to structure it around your commitment to your daughter in that way. So uh, it's it's really fabulous, and I just hope uh, uh, some of our listeners are. Uh, may find themselves in similar situations and will be inspired to do the same in one form or another. There was a young man a while back, I, sometime last year, early, been over a year ago probably, or somewhere around in there. Anyway, a young man who was a graduate of the event, and so we had that connection. And thank goodness he reached out to me because sadly, tragically, he was going through a divorce. And uh, well, it's not always tragic. Sometimes it's actually the right thing to do. But at any rate, he was going through a divorce and 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 he had a, a young child and and he was, you know, just being kind of clueless about the thing and was in danger of really losing his parental rights. Uh, so my coaching with him was to get him to step up to the plate and uh, really get in there. And uh, so he did. And he has a similar situation uh, that you have uh, today where he um, he has uh, his child with him as a full time parent week on week off kind of situation. But he was he was in danger of of uh, letting all that go, just you know, really for a, a lack of information, a lack of understanding what's possible, and and really not having gotten in touch with who he was as a dad and and how important that was to him. And once that was awoken in him, that shifted everything. Thank goodness. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I only had it uh, kind of put put to me recently it's like i enjoy being a dad and i never really thought about that uh, until someone pointed it out it's like oh yes i enjoy it very much you know not always all the minutia uh for sure um but yes i enjoy being a dad it's one of my favorite things well for sake of full transparency um you know when i uh was raising my son or not raising my son this was my pre-prison years and although i my personal evolution work had begun. I led. I had this kind of schizoid life, was doing a lot of positive things on the one hand, and then totally involved in a completely crazy shadow world with drugs and addiction on the other hand. And the person who got the short end of the stick with that was my son. Uh, and so even though I deluded myself into thinking that I was a good dad and loved my son, and in fact, I really wasn't showing up. So um, if I had that all to do all over again, that would be a, a great blessing. Uh, I don't. Unfortunately, uh, today I have a, a good ongoing relationship with my son, and we're still working through all that stuff. But but we're close, and he's 42 today. So, um, but I'm I'm grateful that you're having this opportunity to to really uh, 
not only enjoy your role as a dad, but really contribute to your daughter's life so that she's going to be set up uh, to, you know, just have a lot of natural uh, strength, resilience, and confidence as she begins to move towards her adulthood life. Yeah, it's a, that is my goal. Mm-hmm. That is my goal. That's great. She's a That's great. Happy, healthy human being. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about a little bit about maybe we uh, uh, can just you know talk about this together a little bit. So you and I are, uh, are together really in the process of launching a business, right? Um, you know, I've done a little soft launch stuff in the past with uh, having some online courses, a radical responsibility course, and a mindful leadership course, and and uh, you know I've had a, a little bit of success here or there marketing that and done some some joint ventures uh, and uh, with people, but n- never really jumping into it full blown. And uh, then we connected around this possibility of developing this uh, online business together, which is going to be Windhorse, Windhorse Seminars Online. And we're really, we're, we're full into it right now. And I know you've made a big commitment to it and let go of some other sources of livelihood. So you're kind of uh, jumping off the cliff a little bit and uh, we're both working very hard at it. And so uh, what's it like for you to be in, in the startup phase with this business and all the uncertainty that comes with that and the hard work and, and, uh, and uh, you know, what, what's that like for you? And, and how has your uh, work in the event or the Tony Robbins training or the Mankind Project, how does, how does that support you in, in what we're doing? Hmm. Any layered question? Um, well, to start, it's uh, gratifying and terrifying. Um, you know, it feels like starting starting a business uh, or launching uh, a business again, kind of from the ground up, um, is is a little terrifying because it's the you know there's always something that I don't know. Uh, there's always something I need to figure out. Um, you know, in some ways that's that's scary, and in some ways. I, I like figuring things out and I like solving problems. Um, so there's, there's joy in that. Um, it's, uh, it kind of came about because I wanted to, to serve in a different way. Um, you know, all of this growth work that I've done, um, I was wanting to, to use it, uh, in a way that, you know, would serve, people would serve others would serve my friends and family better um you know i considered uh, a year or two ago even going back and becoming a, a therapist or maybe getting a phd or some way of um you know the way that i knew to to serve and to do this work um and you know it became clear pretty quickly that having you know being the parent I want to be, uh, didn't really, didn't really sit with those plans. Uh, didn't really make sense. And, uh, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial lifestyle would, w- could do that, you know, assuming everything worked, uh, could do that, um, in a way that the, you know, the business serves. Um, and that is, uh, you know, that's what it feels like I'm doing and we're building, you know, it's it's a business, but yes, it is in the service of it is in the service of others, and um, you know that's gratifying and enlivening. And uh, feel like it, you know, in all the ways I feel like growing, and I'm I'm happy to serve is is wrapped up in this in this business, and as the aim of of this business uh, is helping others and hopefully, you know, uh, having a livelihood that supports that for me and my daughter. That's great. And, you know, that's why, you know, I'm a big fan of the entrepreneurial lifestyle. Uh, It just gives us more, I mean, it's hard work. Uh, Anybody that thinks it's not hard work is kidding themselves. It's incredibly hard work. And, and, and in the early years uh, of any business or entrepreneurial career, sometimes you're going to be working a lot more than, if you had a regular job, uh, but if you're on the right track over time, you can learn how to get your business successful and then learn how to become a business owner and, uh, and, uh, um, create, you know, a reasonable lifestyle and health life, you know, good life work balance. But, but actually you're doing that already because I know you're really uh, dedicated to your time with your daughter and you are 
finding a way to balance those things. And as am I, I'm, I'm dedicated to my uh, relationship with my partner, Sophie, and uh, and uh, to taking care of myself and the meditation and physical uh, exercise and workout and health and all that. So I think we're we're both doing a pretty good job of of staying balanced while we're in this startup phase with a uh, with a new business, but it does take a lot of work. Uh, but it's also very exciting. And uh, what you mentioned, you know, that it that it is about serving. Uh, I I think is is really the key for me. And uh, and if, as I've explored and and if I'm working to model other successful entrepreneurs, the ones at least that I'm really attracted to and that are super successful uh, really have that spirit. It's all about service. Uh, um, you know the the benefits come along and the success comes along, but really as a uh, a result of or a, almost a side benefit of really being in that space of service. And for me, I, I picked up on something um, during uh, early on in my prison years. I was very involved in twelve step work just to uh, deal with my own substance abuse issues at the time. And uh, uh, my early sponsor made it very clear to me that. That you know, if I really wanted this to work for me, uh, become someone who made it available to others, and uh, you know, over the time I've extrapolated that into a, a little talk I give sometimes. It's called being at source, and you know, we've all been trained to be consumers, and uh, and you know that that's one way to live our lives, and we're all going to be consumers on some level or another. But uh, to to at least at some point of our life to become creators who are making things available to others to to be at source for other people and providing something of value to other people is really seems to be one of the deepest pools and reservoirs of potential meaning and purpose in life. Uh, and it sounds like you've tapped into that as well. Yeah, definitely gives me energy and, and purpose mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and fulfillment. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah, so uh, we're kind of nearing the end of our time here today, and uh, this has really been great talking uh, through these uh, um, areas of your life and learning learning more about uh, how you're approaching things and how the work you've done has, has benefited you and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have a particular uh, uh, book or movie or something like that that you'd like to plug a bit not not your own for commercial purposes but just that something that has uh you know you've gotten you excited or you think is really meaningful or somebody's work you would recommend people taking a look at or or you know just anything you have even found particularly entertaining of late um man there's a list i feel like i'm uh i'm a giant consumer of uh all of this um even actually have to make a living i feel like i just sit around read and listen to podcasts all day (laughs) uh uh, wow um books i feel like i'd have a list um i don't even know where to start well which one stands out just what comes first either either book or podcast something that's you know got your attention Uh, the one i started uh uh, the one I started delving into recently was the was the the Rogan podcast mm-hmm. uh, with all of his interviews. I mean, the one I was listening to um, over breakfast was uh, with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, but the ones that you know I just consumed, you know, six hours straight of podcasts was the 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 Peters episode and I think Jonathan Haidt episode about education and um, you know masculinity and femininity and um all of kind of all of the things that are up right now uh a different version of you know what's going on um with the me too movement and toxic masculinity and um you know feminism and also education and you know it was so much wrapped into just a couple of episodes Uh, i was you know i was uh that was a lot to take in, and it was it was so gratifying. Well, that's a great recommendation, and not that uh, Joe Rogan needs any promotion from from us. He's doing quite well, I think. But uh, but happy to promote uh, his work anyway, and hopefully one day maybe he'll hear the Radical Responsibility uh, podcast and want to uh, return a favor. But yeah, he, he gets some great guests on there. He's a great interviewer, and. Uh, uh, Jonathan Haidt and and uh, Jordan Peterson, both a little controversial in some ways, but very interesting people to listen to. And and yeah, I think it's fascinating work. I know that you're you've been 
uh, following Mark Manson's work as well, and even Pagan and others. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins, and and uh, did you pick up um, uh, the Man Up book? I did. Yeah. I did. I've not finished that one yet, mm -hmm. but yes, yeah, very, very, uh, very interesting book, and it is not as uh, you know as uh, uh, NFL football ish as the title sounds, but. It's really about this very same work. And you did mention something, you know, about uh, in the Joe Rogan interviews where they were covering some of this territory of, you know, the Me Too movement and this whole cultural wave that we're going through right now. And, and you know, the, the concerns about toxic masculinity, which have really had a lot of negative impact on our world. And, and so, you know, that for me harkens back to your work with the Mankind Project, which I'm very grateful to have recently gotten involved in myself. I've been recommending people to the Mankind Project for a long time. In fact, I may have steered you there. I can't remember. Um, uh, just because I knew about it and trusted it and knew it would be a good resource for men to continue their work. And I was finally able to do a uh, the initial kind of a weekend training, the New Warrior Training Adventure back in December, and it was fabulous. And went to my first I group or integration group last night. So very happy to be in that work. But, you know, people might hear the term Mankind Project or even men's groups or the men's movement, you know, wonder what that's about. And uh, but it's very much about um, at least um, and I'll let you talk about it, but it, it is dealing with these issues of toxic masculinity and and not continuing to act out of our shadow, but finding a healthy way uh, to show up in the world, but still showing up as men trying to find a healthy masculinity. So I'm, I'm curious if you have any more to say about that. Uh, yeah, uh, it's also very kind of controversial topic. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind when I hear the term, uh, toxic masculinity is, uh, it's almost defensive. It's like masculinity is not toxic. Mm -hmm. Uh, masculinity is not, is not, uh, evil or broken or aggressive or all of those, you know, kind of negative traits that, it, that get put on it. Um, you know, as a, as a judgment, you know, men are not evil. Uh, men are not causing all the harm in the world. Uh, so there's a kind of defensiveness that comes up first for mm -hmm. me. Um, you know, sure, there's a, you know, use the term shadow, but when I think of, uh, you know, the, the behaviors, um, that are causing the most harm, you know, in the, in the psychological perspective, it's like, those are not, those are not adults. Those are, those are children doing, you know, childish things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, boys, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not, it's like, it, it feels like toxic boyhood. Mm -hmm. It's like boys that have yet to become men mm -hmm. uh, and haven't learned what masculinity is and what uh, an adult man is and what an adult man does. You know, it's about service and it's about, you know, strength in a way of um, safety. And, you know, it's about getting things done, but in a way that is for the good of mankind, you know, uh, service, you know, with a capital S. You know. One of the things, you know, one of the contexts around, you know, masculinity and femininity that I like the best is that. You know, it's a, it's a masculine move to create th the safe space so that women can work their magic. You know, women are, is the transforming energy and men is the, the like stabilizing, grounding, safe energy. Um, and I think that plays out in, in everything, in, in relationship, in, you know, hopefully in, in the rest of life. Um, so. Well, I'm glad you jumped right into that and didn't shy away from the controversies involved because uh, on this Radical Responsibility podcast, we are not going to shy away from any of these controversies. And, uh, you know, I think it is really important. I, as well, when I hear the term toxic masculinity, I get a little bit defensive and I, I don't really like the term. Uh, I understand some of what it's pointing to, and I agree with you. This is unformed. Uh, uh, this is... Uh, chronologically adult men who are still acting out of their uh their child mind and uh and the, and all the shadow stuff uh, as we know the the book king warrior magician lover is a, a a great book within the men's movement and uh 
And it talks there about the kind of boyhood versions of these masculine archetypes and then, you know, how you develop into the healthy male version of those and where it goes off track. And you end up with, uh, you know, instead of getting into being a tyrant or a bully and, and various things like that, or being a, you know, a Don Juan Lothario or, you know, being abusive around sexuality or the use of uh, intimacy and love and things like that. So, um, yeah, so, you know, but because a lot of what in the current, you know, political climate and, you know, again, to be transparent, I've been on the left my whole life, a progressive, a lefty. I was pretty radical back in my college days in the anti-Vietnam War uh, movement era. And uh, but the, the the more what I would think of as a further left area of our political spectrum these days, uh, you know, they'll use the term toxic masculinity. And they're really just kind of talking about masculinity, if they're honest. You know, in many ways, they're just really saying masculinity is dangerous. We don't like it. It's, you know, and you're really generalizing it. And then, you know, I, I've even heard many, uh, you know, people speaking publicly out of that space and that mindset of really uh, associating every sociopolitical, cultural, environmental problem we have, that the root cause of that is uh, men. And uh, so as a man, I, that obviously makes me a little defensive. But at the same time, I'm open to, OK, what is our part in that? Uh, but I think, you know, the I think if we're really going to sometimes part of my brain says that we're going to talk about toxic masculinity, we should be willing to talk about toxic femininity as well, because, um, mm -hmm. you know, both genders have their their shadow versions. And of course, today, even what you were saying about these classic roles of the deep masculine and the deep feminine, feminine, which we can find throughout human mythology and all cultures throughout time and articulated in some interesting ways and in uh, Carl Jung's work and and uh, uh, Joseph Campbell's work and others, um, that even talking about those uh, politically, a lot of people don't even want to hear that today, right? Just the the idea is that there is even any identifiable uh, mas deep masculine or deep feminine. Uh, for a lot of people, they would just rather deconstruct all of that. And uh, so I, I think there's and and you know of course. Uh, Jordan Peterson's a big voice out in that controversy and so forth. So that is something we're going to address on this podcast, just so our listeners know that and uh, explore that and get as many different viewpoints as we can. I hope to get some guests on here that come from that more, what is now, I would say, the further left end of the political spectrum view on it. And I hope to get, uh, if I can get so lucky as to get Jordan Peterson on here uh, for an episode, we'll do that. But it is an area we're going to explore. And it's not that... Uh, uh, I certainly don't want to assert that I have any of the final answers, but my my um, biggest concern is that we keep the conversation going, because what what I experience and the frustrations I uh, experience from some sectors, really on the left and the right, is they they want to prevent the conversation from happening and use various forms of intimidation and shaming to shut down the conversation. So this podcast is going to be very much about having that open conversation, just for the sake of continuing to grow uh, as humanity, as a, a, our, our collective destiny as human beings. So I'm really glad that you uh, were willing to address that. Um, I, I think the last thing here is I, I want to bring up a particular creative project of yours that I know a little bit about. You've mentioned it in passing to me several times, but I believe you're working on a photographic book and that it has to do with... Uh, 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 tattoos, and I think it also has to do with people who identify as being transgendered. So, could you say a little something about that? Sure. Uh, those are actually two different projects. Oh, okay. I uh, have mixed up. Sometimes we'll <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, the first one is, uh, yeah, a book I feel like I've been working on for, I think it's been over 10 years. Um, it's a book about. Uh, first tattoos, uh, but in the context of, um, you know, skin and our bodies as being a canvas for art, mm -hmm. you know, so it's the, you know, using, using your body for self-expression, using your body for, you know, in some cases, self-empowerment and telling your own story and sometimes to have no story just because you want, you want to be covered, you know, um, so I photograph you know the the body and the pieces as as artwork mm -hmm. you know, in a way to show how 
where it is on the body to beautify it. You know, in some cases they're portraits and in some cases there's faces, but it's not about that so much in this case. Um, and my hope as soon as I, I continue to, well, I will commit to having this book out by, uh, by the, uh, holiday season in, in some shape or form and a gallery show. That's correct. Now that's uh, the radical responsibility spirit there. So, uh. You're saying uh, you will have it out this year in 2019 before the holiday season. Yes, Great. meaning it needs to be finished uh, by summertime so I can get it you know, printed and published oh. properly. All right. Great. So that's a closer so. goal. You're going to have it finished by – you're going to have it ready to go into production by uh, sometime this summer. Great. So yeah. we're, we're going to hold you to that here on the Radical Responsibility Podcast. Good. <laughs> Good. The more people that could do that, the better. This has been a, a long labor of love, and my my attention to detail and perfection often gets in the way of this one. So, yeah. So you mentioned there were two possible books there. Uh, the second one at the moment is uh, it's going to be a, a gallery show. Um, it's, uh, I think, actually we slated it to go up uh, in Brooklyn. I believe it was the first week of May. I'll have to come back to get final dates. Um, it'll be a gallery show, and it started out as a program, uh, as a project photographing mostly uh, drag kings. Uh, you know, women typically, you know, women who dress up as men. Uh, although it could be someone who's transgender dressing up as men. It could be someone who's essentially any any identifying factor even you know it doesn't matter uh, like a woman could be a drag queen a man could be a drag king it just depends on how they want to present mm -hmm. uh themselves and, and, you, and the show, you mentioned drag kids is that what you said so this is mostly younger kids, people sorry sorry drag kings oh you said drag kings, kings. i'm sorry right got it. yep that's all right so as opposed to queens who get uh a lot of you know they've actually in the media in the last probably five to ten years, a lot of uh, prestige and a lot of play because they are glamorous well, Ru and they're very Ru showy. Ru has her, her own uh, show, which is, uh, is fascinating to watch, actually. Most definitely. Most definitely. And someone in the in the Brooklyn scene has actually won that show, I think, last season. Um, so That's great. So essentially, this, uh, this book is about you know, kind of the same idea we talked about in the beginning. It's about taking what you know, feels real and authentic for those people and beautifying mm -hmm. it. You know, um, a lot of people discover themselves on stage and I've not, you know, I've not been bold enough to do a show. I've never put myself out that way. Um, and I have a lot of respect and admiration for the people that do and my friends that do. Um, and it feels like they, they discover more and more about themselves. Um, every time they go out on stage and perform uh, and they can experiment with themselves. Um, you know, this identity, that identity, this way of showing up. Um, and, you know, kind of like the, the tattoo project and even the growth work, it's, you know, celebrating and beautifying, you know, in the way that I do, um, who they are and what they stand for and what, uh, you know, what they're all about. So. Great. So is there a website where people can find out, uh, you know, keep track of your book coming out or the show uh, that uh, you're going to have in Brooklyn? Uh, the show, when I get a final date, I will make that public. Uh, the book right now, uh, the work for most of the work for that book is on my my photographic website, which is uh, ericukelevich.com. I will spell because it's complicated. Uh, E-R-I-C-J-U-K. E L E V I C S dot com. And there's a button for um, illuminated ink. And you can see the, the photographs there. Uh, along with those photographs in the book, there will be quotes from everyone that I've uh, photographed. Uh, those are not on the website, but they will be in the book and in the show. And uh, part of the part of the final project, because it's about how they feel about the work and what it means to them. So. Great. So ericukelovich.com. And we'll have that on our podcast website. We'll have next to your bio, we'll have uh, your website so people will be able to find it there as well. 
Well, this has been great. So uh, thank you very much, Eric. And it's great to uh, get this uh, uh, very first podcast uh, in the can or something like that, as I used to be the expression or something. And um, so um, congratulations to both of us for uh, for doing this and really exciting. And I, I can't wait to get your this episode on the air. I think people will find it very uh, interesting and inspiring. So thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome and offering uh, offering the space for me. Thank you. Great. So and thank you to all of our listeners. So this was uh, Eric Ukelovich and uh, I am Fleet Mall and you've been listening to the Radical Responsibility Podcast and wish you all the very best. <laughs>